Hello, a very warm welcome to you from wherever in the world you're watching to this, a special edition of Deal Stream, the show where we introduce you to some of the sharpest, most exciting startups in clean tech. And over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, we'll bring you five startups all of which have progressed through to the Climate Kick Accelerator. Now, if you haven't watched DealStream before, the format is very simple. Five startups, as I say, they'll each get a two-minute video pitch uh, followed by a five-minute live Q&A. So what we're trying to do is essentially replicate a live pitch setting. Now, all of the startups that you're about to see are seeking funding, some more so than others. And there are some really, really exciting ideas that we're about to discover. Welcome along to DealStream. But I won't be asking the questions on my own because alongside me throughout the course of the program will be Helen Lynn. Th Helen, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to have you alongside me. Um, I'm sure there are people watching that know you, Helen, but for those that don't, could you just give us a little bit of a background in, in your way in the space? Sure. I'm with a venture capital fund based out of Silicon Valley called At One Ventures. Our thesis is we invest in a world where humanity is a net positive impact to nature. Um, and that translates into basically we're seeking technologies that can disrupt the major industries that contribute to climate change and other environmental problems. You're going to be asking some questions alongside me and what is, of course, a, a virtual pitch setting. It has to be virtual these days because of COVID. How have you found virtual pitches, I suppose, since the, the outbreak of the pandemic? They've actually been surprisingly okay. Um, obviously, you know, in person always feels the best, um, but at the same time, you know, viewing the pitches virtually allows us to actually talk to more companies um, because we don't spend time traveling to meetings and, and that sort of thing. So there is some efficiency in it too. I mean, it's probably fair to say as well that you speak to a whole host of startups on a regular basis. You know what qualities to be looking for. You know, you go out and source these startups. That is that is exactly what you do. So how do you tend to assess them? What are your key criteria for assessing startups? Well, since we're an impact focused fund, environmental impact is really high on our priority list during our assessment. Um, I would say in the triumvirate of due diligence uh, beyond environmental impact, it's also the feasibility of the technology and then the unit economics commercially of how the costs of it compare to the traditional technology that it's trying to displace. So those three things are our big priorities. Well, we've got a lot coming up on the program today. Let's have a little look at what's in store for us, Helen. In a few moments, we'll be finding out a little bit more about the companies that you see listed here. So we've got Multis, Nanomic Technology, Maclec, Leafy Life as well. Uh, startups based in Kenya, India, the UK and Turkey. So it's got a very global feel to it, uh, this particular deal stream. Really excited to speak to some of these startups. But before we begin, uh, a legal notice. And as you can see there, that little section, who is it for? The information provided in this deal stream is of course only intended for investment professionals in the EU, the UK and Switzerland. Climate Kick doesn't provide investment advice nor any representation about the companies featured. And the content of this broadcast hasn't been approved by an authorised person within the meaning of the UK financial services regulations. So of course, if you choose to invest, it is your capital at risk and you may not get any or all of your money back. That is our legal notice out of the way, of course. Let's get stuck into this edition of DealStream. Okay, without further ado, to our very first startup. They are called Carbominer, a company that has developed a really interesting technology capable of capturing CO2 from the open air and then selling it on to interested parties. Their CEO is Nikos Seiko. Hello. I am Niko Seiko, I live in Kiev, Ukraine, and I lead the Carbominer project. Most people treat carbon dioxide as a dangerous waste as it is strongly linked to the climate change and global warming. However, some disagree and they can use it for good and even pay real money for carbon dioxide as a commodity. Those people are greenhouse operators. However, carbon dioxide they buy is neither cheap nor climate friendly. Here we, Carbominer, come with our deal, which is very simple. 
We are going to sell carbon dioxide uh, to greenhouse operators at a very affordable price of 135 euros per ton. How can we do it? Because we developed a very efficient technology to directly capture carbon dioxide from the open air and we can do it locally on site nearby the greenhouse. We have defined in our target market as greenhouse operators of European Union. This market is big enough having 220,000 of hectares. Our first country, Spain, uh, we can uh, serve there about 5,000 hectares and this will secure us an annual sales of 140 million euros. We have raised our seed round in October and we're using it now to build our first industrial scale prototype. Our plan is to put it to field pilot test uh, in March next year and we also arrange it for this with one of our potential plans. We're looking for investors to participate in our next Series A round, which we are going to raise in May 2021. We will use this investment to establish a production facility nearby Kyiv and also to install a demo greenhouse there, which will be using our capturing modules to feed carbon dioxide into the greenhouse. Thank you. It was the Carbon Miner presentation. And Nick is our very first guest on this episode of DealStream. Welcome along, Nick. It's great to speak to you. How are you doing? Uh, thank you. I'm fine. Uh, hi, James. Hi, Helen. I'll tell you what, Nick. I want to be your first customer because I really like the Carbo Miner hoodies. Can I, can I buy one of those, please? Sure. We will be happy to send you. Well, look, we've got a couple of questions for you each. Uh, I'm really excited to speak to you, Nick. First question for me, what will you do with the investment? What's the roadmap ahead? Uh, well, uh, we're going to raise uh, our next round, I would call it late seed, uh, in uh, April or May next year. And we intend to use it for building a production facility nearby Kyiv uh, and to set up a demo greenhouse there and we will feed our captured carbon dioxide into this uh, demonstration uh, greenhouse. Over to you, Helen. Great. Could you maybe just tell us a little bit about how exactly the technology works? Um, there are other direct air capture companies out there. So how does your technology compare to theirs and how is it unique or differentiated? Uh, okay. Uh, I would say that uh, the differentiating point for our technology is the combination of both uh, wet capture and dry capture approaches. Uh, we are good uh, in dry capture, we use the adsorption process for that, and the outcome of our first phase is enriched mix of carbon dioxide and air. And the, the second part, the second phase, the uh, wet capturing uh, is working to uh, pull carbon dioxide of this midstream and create the pure uh, outcome of uh, CO2 at the end. Nick, your, uh, your pitch said that you're going to sell CO2, what was it, 135 euros per tonne. Uh, on the face of it, that sounds sort of quite cheap, I suppose. So what's, what, what's the cost to you? Uh, oh, well, uh, uh, I would say that uh, any startup, any business uh, must have a healthy margin and that's why the, the product must be you know, with enough lower cost. And uh, our cost is a bit below, current cost is a bit below 100 euros and uh, to be uh, more precise, in the range of 92 to 97 euros. This is best our estimation at the moment. And when you talk about your margins, um, in terms of your cash inflows and your revenue streams, are those purely commercial revenue streams or are there also some carbon credits um, and carbon offset type revenue in, in uh, your revenue stream as well? Uh, thank you. Uh, we uh, keep uh, an eye on uh, carbon credits, but our current financial projections are based solely on commercial uh, incomes. So we are going to sell carbon dioxide first of all and uh, we will learn, we will find out what are uh, our additional opportunities with carbon credits, both in US, like California, and in Europe. Nick, we're getting through this quite quickly, so I think we can ask you a, a couple more, uh, another question each, I suppose. I mean, you were saying that Spain, in your piece there, would be the first 
EU market for carbo miner to enter. Do, do you consider other EU countries as well or other parts of the world? Mm, well, uh, you know, um, most of uh, accelerators, they somehow force participating startups to focus uh, as much as possible. And uh, it is good. So we uh, uh, choose uh, the greenhouse operators as our target market. And because of this, uh, we have selected Spain as our first target country because Spain itself has about uh, 70,000 hectares of greenhouse space. This is more than one third of total European Union greenhouse area. Uh, however, uh, if uh, you could, could have a wider look uh, on our potential markets, that of course not only greenhouse operators need carbon dioxide, and uh, it is uh, not only a country of Spain which is seeking solutions to uh, follow uh, EU uh, Green Deal and to be carbon neutral, carbon zero uh, at the year 2050. So. Uh, I think we could go to other countries too. As an example, uh, recently we have uh, got, we have received an official invitation from the government of uh, UK, the agency, uh, to participate in carbon removal competition there. And uh, uh, we are very serious uh, about this, to participate. Uh, I think that uh, it's a great possibility for us to demonstrate the technology uh, as, as a showcase there. They are going to That's erect... Great. Yeah, they are going to erect several pilot plans for DAC, direct air capture there, in five years. Okay, thank you. So my final question um, is around the transportation logistics. So how, once you capture the CO2, how do you handle transporting it to your customers? Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, our solution uh, is based on compact capture modules. So our first uh, target form factor is the standard shipment 20 feet container. And our plan is to eliminate transportation uh, part of the total CO2 cost at all, because we are going to install it nearby the greenhouse and just send the carbon dioxide via the pipe to the client. Nick, it's a real pleasure to speak to you on DealStream. Thank you so much for being our very first guest. Thank you. And I'll write you an email about that hoodie as well. Take care. Thanks. Okay, one down, four more to go in today's deal stream, and Nick gets us off to a really stellar start. We're heading from Ukraine now to London, from CO2 mining to cultivated meat. Maltus Media is the startup, and Kai Linton is their CEO. He can explain what the problem is that they're solving. The future of the food industry is cultivated meat. Companies can take a single animal cell to grow actual meat, giving the same taste and experience as conventional meat, just with only a fraction of the environmental impact and without the need to kill any animals or use any antibiotics. The key challenge preventing this entire new industry from commercialising is the cost of production, where the feed, or the growth media in this case, takes up more than 80% of production costs. Traditionally, Animal blood serum is used to grow stem cells for biomedical research. But this is not only very expensive, but clearly goes against the ethical and sustainability aspirations of the cultivated meat industry. And that is why we're focusing not on producing cultivated meat ourselves, but instead on creating a completely animal-free alternative to blood serum that is designed to meet the cost, scale, and performance requirements for companies to produce cultivated meat affordably and profitably at scale. With a focus on growth media development, we are creating a systematic approach to finding the best formulation for a variety of cell lines and processes. So how does this fit into the big picture? The global meat market is worth well over a trillion dollars and is only growing. An analysis by A.T. Kearney predicts that by 2040, cultivated meat will make up 35% of this market. But looking at the short term, even though cultivated meat isn't available on the market yet, there's a growing demand for growth media as many companies are now scaling their production. The growth media market will be worth over $600 million in value by 2024, 
and grow to almost $25 billion by 2030. We are currently raising a £1.5 million note round for the next 18 months to bring Proliferum M, our first product designed for growing beef and pork products, to market and then to expand our product catalogue then to cover companies working on chicken and duck cells. And Kai is on DealStream. Welcome along, Kai. How's it going? Hi, doing well, thanks. Good Great. Well, look, Helen is alongside me. We've both got some questions for you. I believe you two might already know each other, so forgive me if I'm crashing the party. So, uh, Kai, just give me a sense of what competition there is in the growth media market and a sort of semi-related question. How does yours perform against others in the space? Cool. So, so actually, there are, there are only really a, a handful of, of companies working on growth media for the cultivated meat industry, and, and all of those are at a very early stage in development. So, so in that sense, we see many different approaches to this challenge of, of growing uh, meat cells without animal components. And, and the way ours differ primarily is that not only are we generating this more standardized approach, whereby we can offer an off-the-shelf solution to many of these, these companies, we're also then putting in the technology such that at scale, we can really bring down the cost so significantly to make cultivated meat affordable to the end consumer. That's great. So on the topic of cost, um, how, I mean, if you could give a high level sense of how does the cost of your growth media compare to serum based media and other non serum based media? Um, and how exactly are you able to make it so cheap? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So so right now there there is a precedent that exists within the biomedical or pharmaceutical space. Um, so if you look at, at fetal bovine for example, fetal bovine serum for example, um, as as well as serum free alternatives, they cost about four hundred dollars per liter at the moment. And if we're looking at how much growth media will be required to grow a kilogram of of cultivated meat, for example, um, with scale and advances in bioreactor technology that might be brought down to about six liters per kilogram. So, so clearly there needs to be a significant reduction. Um, so part of our technology is really threefold really. So um, firstly on, on the performance element, what we have is this whole pipeline for growth media development, whereby we're using uh, kind of very data-driven statistical models to define what are the best combinations of ingredients to grow these different types of cells efficiently. But then secondly, we're looking at how we then produce the, the input ingredients more efficiently. So instead of sticking with the, the strict regulation and, and high grade of, of pharmaceutical products, we can actually design the whole production process to be more suited for the food industry. And in that sense, in combination with scale and, and more streamlined purification technologies, um, then, then we can bring down the cost enough. And Kai, you mentioned chicken and duck cells at the end of your video there. What, what's the time scale I wonder on those developments? Sure. So with our first product, Proliferum M, we will be going through a customer feedback and validation stage early next year. And then actually by the end of 2021, be in a position where we have a, a market ready product to, to start selling commercially. Um, as that goes to market, we will then expand our, our product development into avian cells and we'll have that available um, in, at the end of, of 2022. So in terms of the technology itself, how defensible is it? Um, you know, there's a lot of large pharma companies out there that are the ones that are currently producing the majority of growth media today. They're obviously very well resourced. So would it be possible in theory to reverse engineer your serum once it's commercialized? Yeah, there, there is a possibility to, to reverse engineer this. Um, although actually in terms of IP, we, we have um, IP across the two different software pieces we have, both on the formulation and also the, the protein engineering. And then in terms of other areas of IP is that the formulation specifically, as well as the specific production system and the proteins themselves. So there's a lot of IP that we can patent there and protect long term. Um, and the others we will keep as a, a trade secret and, and prevent through, through contracts, uh, reverse engineering. But obviously at scale, we then really need to rely on the uh, the reach that we have within this industry, the relationships that we're building now, uh, and the additional benefits that we offer through you know those ingredient components, which means that others can't just uh, take the recipe and, and create the same product. 
And Kai, just one final thing before we go. We've had a question in from the audience from Nins Ema. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, let's see if we can uh, get an answer to this. Uh, wow, does it feel like real meat? Can I feel the sinews whilst tasting the cultivated meat? So uh, a little bit of a funny one to end on there, Kai. What's your answer to that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the beauty of, of cultivated meat is, is that it is real fat and uh, muscle components that that you're you're eating so it's it's real meat at the end of the day um it's really just producing them in you know large fermentation tanks like we brew beer as opposed to uh, a cow um so yes yeah, so at, at the end of the day ultimately it'll taste the same it'll cost the same uh cook the same everything like that it'll be exactly the same product well look kai it's great to speak to you thank you so much for being part of deal stream good luck in the fundraising thank you very much great to be here Yeah, we are really working our way through it. And as I said there, if you do have any questions and want to flag them up, obviously you'll be watching on the YouTube link, then just pop them in the chat there and we'll get through some over the course of the program. It's also worth mentioning that you should be signing up to the Climate Kick Investor Marketplace. There's a whole host of really fantastic startups that are constantly getting added to that marketplace. If you're an investor looking for a particular type of investment, there are lots of tools you can have at your disposal to tailor what you want. Uh, lots of different asks, lots of different sectors, lots of different types of investments are available. So please do go ahead and log on to the Climate Kick Investor Marketplace. I'll mention that more uh, again later on. But for now, let's press on with today's deal stream. We've got another startup coming up, this one, Nanomike Biotechnology, who have an innovative solution to prevent fruit and vegetables from decaying because of microorganisms. Clearly, the effects of such technology could be profound indeed. And here to explain a little bit more is Arda. Hello, everybody. I'm Arda, co-founder and CTO of Nanomic Biotechnology. Nanomic develops microcapsulated biopesticide, thus protecting crops against plant pathogens, increasing harvest yield and post-harvest shelf life. Every year, 25% of fruits and vegetable produce in the world are lost due to the fungi spoilage. In order to prevent this loss, producers use synthetic fungicides in the field. However, they have residue on fruits and they can be harmful to human health and also nature. At this point, Nanomic offers an alternative solution to all these problems. We have developed microcapsulated biopesticide to prevent many plant diseases which are multiple action mechanisms for more safer rain. Up to now, we proved our product's efficacy in the field on different kinds of fruits. And we have 95% biological activity against fungi pathogens. And on grapes, we got the approval of Bayer Crop Science Turkey. Also, we are very effective in the post-harvest stage and we can increase shelf life of fruits and vegetables minimum two times. We have two different products on the market now, for farmers in pre-harvest usage and pecan companies for post-harvest usage. Our total market is 16 billion euro fungicide market and we are targeting Turkish fungicide market for three years. We have a multidisciplinary team. Me and my co-founder have both PhD in bioengineering and biotechnology. We also have experienced engineers, agronomists and senior business developers. Our turnover was 120,000 euros in previous year. We need 2 million euros investment to reach 2.8 million euros in 2022. We still have annual 80% available production capacity, so we are going to use this budget to set up our marketing team and for our European field test studies to get our approval. We have a green solution for a real problem. We trust our team and technology, and we know that we can help to produce more cleaner foods for healthier tomorrows. Thank you. Arda, thank you so much for being part of DealStream. How's it going? Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I'm so good. How nice you? to see you. Uh, well, look, we, we've got a couple of questions for you, Helen and I. I'll, I'll get things started. Just first off, Arda, how did the idea for the company come about? Talk me through the influences and how you've got to this point. Yeah, actually, uh, we started to roll with uh, my co-founder and also our team to ask uh, ourselves the question, how did plants protect uh, themselves before the pesticide usage? As a result, uh, we, we found that because they can protect themselves again thousand years against plant pathogens. So they use plant active molecules and we uh, just 
uh, try to figure out this problem uh, the, with this um, bi bi biologic molecules. And we try to uh, enable their usage as a biopesticide. That's great. So my understanding is that 70% of crop loss occurs post-harvest. Um, if this is the case, does that mean that the main benefit of reducing crop loss and therefore increasing sales would be enjoyed by the food distributor rather than the farmer? And if so, then how do you convince the farmer to use the product? Actually, uh, the, the, the crop, uh, the loss, it occurs in the uh, both in pre-harvest and post-harvest stage, of course. And uh, it's the very different process. In, in pre-harvest stage, farmers have to use uh, minimum two or three different uh, fungicide to uh, inhibit their, uh, their total loss. So, uh, and also, it's, this is a different process. It occurs in the both different sites, also in post-harvest stage. Producers also use uh, lost their product in the more logistic state, so they need more shelf life expansion. So uh, with our two different products, we, we are uh, fighting with fungi spoilage, uh, both in pre and post harvest stage. Ada, what are the most important benefits of the technology to your customers? Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the normal, in the traditional uh, fungicide program, farmers generally use uh, synthetic ones and uh, they uh, have to wait for the harvest and they have a uh, minimum two weeks. And we are, we are uh, giving the uh, more elastic uh, free time to whenever they uh, use our product before the harvest. And the, additionally, they use minimum two or three different fungicides in a season. But our product has a wide spectrum effect and they can uh, use our product against different uh, kind of uh, microbes, spoilage uh, caused microbes. So, and also in the cost comparison, we are almost uh, same uh, same price uh, per hectare uh, when the, compared with the synthetic fine side, but we have additional uh, effects, uh, non-residual and more safer products. Hmm, that's clear. So. You mentioned earlier in your pitch that you have had good results with grapes. Um, and I think there was another vegetable in there. So is the biofungicide specific to certain fruits and vegetables? And does that mean that if you want to use it on other fruits and vegetables, you have to start a brand new R&D process to develop a fungicide specific to a new fruit or vegetable? Yeah, yeah no, uh, it's a totally broad range activity. and. Uh, we started from the soft skin fruits, uh, especially grapes and also strawberry and uh, tomato, because they more prone to uh, prone to get the fungi diseases. Because lots of fungi uh, species infect uh, this type of fruits, but it's not limited with this type of fruits. Of course, we worked on the stone type. Uh, in example, cherries uh, and peaches. Uh, it's mostly uh, have a problem in the post harvest stage. So, uh, and also we have a good, um, good uh, result, field test result, more arable food, in example, onion. Arda, that's uh, all we've got time for. I'm afraid it's really fascinating to chat to you. Thank you so much for your time and very good luck with the fundraising. Thank you so much. We are really racing through it. Just two more startups to speak to today. The time is really flying by and it's really fascinating, isn't it? Because it's a real variety of businesses. And we're moving into yet another sector, specifically hydro turbines now. Maklek in India is the startup. They're specialists in mechanical engineering and hydrokinetics. And their co-founder is up next on DealStream. Namaskar. We all know that energy can come from wind and sun but there is plentiful renewable resources covering more than 75% area of the planet that you might not have thought about, our waters. The velocity of streams such as rivers, canals, tides carries plenty of energy that can be harnessed and converted into electricity to power our homes, buildings and cities. The energy available in these running water streams called the hydrokinetic energy and having more than 3000 gigawatt global potential. There are more than 1 billion people 
living in the dark due to lack of any efficient and cost economically viable electricity generation technology. In its last seven years long continuous research and hundreds of field trials, MacLeck invented one of the most cost effective and environmentally sustainable hydrocarbon energy technology called SHK turbines. The SHK turbines is the simplest scalable floating hydrokinetic modules which can be installed in any kind of running water having at least 0.5 meter per second velocity and just 0.4 meter water depth. With lowest capital cost and operational cost, SHK turbines are the most affordable modular simplest yet robust decentralized hydropower system which is easy to fabricate transport, assemble and install with a negligible structure. Apart from energy generation, SK turbines enhance dissolved oxygen level, thereby reduce water pollution and promote aquatic life, also self-rejuvenate the water bodies. MacLeck estimated that along the natural rivers in irrigation canals only, there is enough electricity in the form of running waters to meet significant portion of world's power demand. MacLeck is also committed to enlighten those 1 billion people who are still living in the dark. And for that, MacLeck needs your continuous support and encouragement to bring next evolution in the renewable energy field worldwide. Thank you. And Narian joins us on DealStream now. Thank you for being with us, Narian. How's it going? It's fine, dear. How are you? Yeah, we're doing good. I've got Helen alongside me. We're both really interested to learn some more. I'll start things off. Just give me a sense of who your customers are, Narian. Yeah, so actually our customers are almost all the people who are living at least a 10 kilometer periphery of any running water body, whether it is canal, river, natural stream, artificial stream, tidal stream, even in wastewater drains. These are our direct customers. And beyond that, our technology is best suited to all those existing hydro powered generators who are actually having the upstream and downstream canals. Because in all hydro projects, there is upstream canals and also after generating power, they used to discharge the water in the downstreams. So this turbine has able to install directly at the downstreams. So, and third best point of this technology is it is completely scalable. So it can be used either for the individual farmers to generate few kilowatts like 500 watt, one kilowatt, five kilowatts, and even the larger customers like the industries who are closely situated to nearby the irrigation canal network or any river network. And also this can be uh, uh, connected to the grid so that this can, this can, our power can be transmitted up to thousands of kilometers using grid exchange methodology. So anybody can be our customer. That's great. Can you maybe talk about what the advantages and disadvantages of hydrokinetic energy are over solar and wind? And what, what would be the main advantage that would make a customer choose hydrokinetic over solar and wind? Definitely. So it's a very good question. So the point of, uh, if you compare between solar and wind to hydrokinetics, let me tell you, there is uh, no comparison because all three fields are completely distinguished to one another. But in terms of advantages, hydrokinetics is one of the most advantageous because it doesn't require any kind of storage, energy storage, to make 24-7 power availability. Whether in case of solar, it is available only in daytime. If you require 24-7 power generation, you need to add on battery banks in case of solar. So it's become costlier. In the case of winds, it is completely unpredictable. And maximum wind available, energy available only in the night times, like after 7.30 in the night to till around 4 or 5 p.m. Uh, 5 a.m. in the morning. But in case of hydroquinities, till the time your water is flowing, running, you are capable to generate power. And as far as our technology is concerned, our hydroquinetic turbine is completely different than existing hydroquinetic turbine because it doesn't require to submerge completely. Even in partial submerged state, it can generate power with if maximum efficiency at lowest cost. That's the main advantage of protecting. Now, Ryan, a couple of quick fire questions to finish off. We had a question from Paul who's messaged in. He said, is your module friendly to marine life? And I think you touched on that in the video, but perhaps you could just explain a little bit more there. Absolutely nice question. I would love to answer this question because ultimately, Need, it's need to be an environment sustainable if you generate power from hydro. And yes, our turbine is completely environment friendly, absolutely fitted 
perfectly conditions in front of environment protection because it doesn't have any kind of you can say the swept area if you go for the swept area like if there is a wind turbine they always have a swept area like this so whatever comes it used to cut from this but in case of our turbine there is no swept area whatever comes it go like from the beneath so whatever comes there will be no at all impact to any wildlife any aquatic life nothing Great. Um, so my last question would be around the maintenance of the turbine. Um, you know, being in a waterway, it might be subject to some extreme conditions and wear and tear. So what kinds of maintenance are required? Or are, is there anything costly or specialized parts, you know, that would be difficult to replace, et cetera? Yeah. So as far as the maintenance is concerned, let me tell you very, very clearly, our turbines is highly designed specifically for all those kind of water streams who are having even uh, silt, any kind of floating garbage, any kind of you know uh, salty water. There is no impact on our turbine because its RPM is very low. One thing. Second thing, every single part of turbine which is you know having a potential of breakage are completely. Customized and completely, uh, uh, you know, removable from each other. So, in any time, if anything's uh, damaged, you can remove that particular part. So, in that case, entire turbine rotor is segmented, floaters are segmented, generator, gearbox, and uh, uh, water uh, sensitive elements are actually fitted above the water level. So, in any case, whatever comes, it does not impact at all to the generators and gearbox which is switched above the water. And also, we have developed a specific IoT-based device which is installed above in the upstream of the canal. So, the moment when the velocity or any kind of, you know, adverse impact occurs, it can directly give the complete advanced uh, real-time information to the turbine system and it exists accordingly. So, we have taken care of all the five or six and it works accordingly. Narayan, we're going to have to leave it there, but it's it's really fascinating to speak to you. I know that you're looking to expand into Europe as well. So very good luck with the fundraising. Good luck with everything moving forward. And thank you for being part of DealStream. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Right then, on to our very last startup. And I am rather excited about this one. We're heading from India to Kenya. And many of us, of course, will know the smell and the difficulty of a baby's diaper, but the environmental impact is very much something the world is just waking up to. Leafy Life, based in Kenya, has an answer, and as former Climate Launchpad winners, they must be on to something. Let's hear from their co-founder, Peter. Hi, my name is Peter Gishadza from Leafy Life Limited in Kenya, where we deal with recycling diapers. So the use of diapers is common all over the world, with the market seeing an exponential growth over the last 10 years. The market is estimated to be worth $64 billion by the year 2022. However, there is one major hiccup in this huge industry, the finding a proper way to recycle waste diapers. At the moment, heat is a major um, use, is majorly used in the recycling process, which, is, which makes it very expensive. This sends a lot of diapers to the landfills, where they take over 500 years to decompose, um, during which they emit a lot of methane, which is a serious climate pollutant. We at Leafy Life, however, designed a process, a green process, that reduces the use of heat significantly, making it cheaper. And we've also gone a step further to use part of these recycled parts of the diaper to make a green clean fuel to be used in especially in common settlements. Why you ask? Well, the use of dirty fuels is still common in Nairobi. We have thus targeted um, Kibera, which is the largest slum in the world, um, having a beachhead, this as our beachhead market, having a 25% market share as our early adopters. This translates to 85,000 euros of profit every single year. We are also planning to patent the process, the recycling process, and then licensing it all over the world, which will also be a source of income for us. We are seeking 250,000 euros, which will help us in setting up a prototype plant, which will be possible to recycle seven tons each day, producing 500 liters, which will make it economically feasible to stand alone. We are excited to hear from you guys. Thank you for this opportunity and can't wait to work with you. Thank you. 
And Peter is our last guest on this special edition of Dealstream. Welcome along, Peter. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Yeah, we're doing good. Helen is alongside me. She'll be asking some questions as well. I'll get things started, okay. though, if that's all right. What are the uh, what are the major differences, I suppose, between you, Peter, Leafy Life, and your competitors? Um, so our competitors are basically in two sides of the market. So the first market would be in the recycling side. So most of the companies that have engaged in the recycling process of diapers majorly are using heat, which is making it so um, expensive. So now in our in our case, we developing we've developed a process where we've reduced the amount of heat used, um, and that's reducing the cost of recycling to 45 percent. On the other end, in regards to the fuel, um, so most informal settlements um, in Kenya still use the dirty fuels, and so ideally the major the difference between our fuel and theirs is that ours is a clean fuel, so it burns cleanly with no carbon monoxide, no soot, and very low emissions of CO2. Too, so it's a better in healthy matters yeah okay that sounds great um can you maybe just tell us a little bit about how did you come to choose diapers as a feedstock to make fuel um so ideally uh myself i baby i had to babysit for my nephews for a while so that got us got me thinking in regards to the amount of diapers they go through a day <laughs> like where do they go in regards to being dumped and stuff so once i did a bit of research i actually found out that it's actually a menace most countries especially the developed countries are trying to um, dump them in landfills which is big um, a big economical effect a um, big sorry um, environmental effect but in, here in kenya especially the there is no proper um, waste management system so they end up everywhere and i literally mean everywhere so you find them in rivers you find them in the ocean you find them across the street wherever so ideally we just sat down and this is something now me and our co-founders just took time and to understand like what could be done so finding out so we studied about the diaper and the existing um, recycling processes that are available and just found a way to make it better and if there is a way that we can now recycle part of this diaper to make a better and more useful product out of it. Peter, it yeah. sounds like a, a really fantastic idea and initiative. Just talk me through okay. how costly, I suppose, the fuel production process is. Um, so ideally, the fuel production process for us would be cost, um, wouldn't be highly expensive. The, the expensive part, as I mentioned before, has always been trying to basically recycle the diapers and now getting them back to their basic components, the basic components. So ideally for us, we've significantly reduced the whole recycling process with 45% in regards to cost because of significantly reducing the heat being used. And then we've also now employed um, greener methods which are more effective and um, we are going to implement cheaper methods um, and use enzymes at a certain process to basically um, use less energy and thus make it um, more cost effective and thus really the cost of the fuel making it cheaper for the people to use. Yeah. Okay and to continue on about the process of how you do it itself, um, are there any other environmental impacts from the process like are there any side byproducts or waste products that come out of the process of conversion into fuel are there any emissions, you know, from from the process that are released into the atmosphere and those kinds of issues? Um, ideally, actually, for the we, we actually had to take a long time to understand the bio the 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 aside byproducts of whatever we'll be making, and that now we had to tailor most of the cleaning process, especially to actually find a way to break down the. The most significant parts of the diapers to their most essential pros, um, products in which they are not harmful to the environment so ideally so well, by the end of the day we just broke it down to three basic parts and they are all now recyclable and they are not harmful to the environment um, for the waste ideally we, the, 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 we have planned to make a small bioreactor um, so a biodigester which will ideally use that to produce energy to power the plant and all that and then, as I said, in the in the production of the fuel, there are 
processes that we've ideally um, implemented, like um, enzymes and um, uh, bio, um, sorry, enzymes, which is basically um, um, animals. So ideally, at that point, uh, they do not rep um, have any adverse effects to the environment. In regards to our highest um, maybe env uh, environmental impact would be because we, we, we will need to still use electricity at some point from the main grid. So ideally, that would be what would be like a negative um, impact in the environmental sector. Yeah. Peter, we uh, will have to leave it there, but it's really fascinating to speak to you. And thank you so much for being part of this deal stream. Good luck with all of the fundraising. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Helen, debrief time. What are your thoughts on the five startups we just showcased? So Carbo Miner, Maltus Media, Nanomike, Maclec, and Leafy Life. A really broad range of uh, of interests and subjects. Yeah, um, it really did run the gamut today, uh, both globally and, uh, and kind of technology-wise. Um, I think they're all doing some really interesting things. Um, some of them are in slightly competitive spaces, and so it would probably um, be interesting just to dig a little bit more into how they plan on maintaining a competitive edge. Um, and some of them, you know, I've never heard of diapers before being used to make fuel, so some of them definitely do seem very, very unique. And that's the point, isn't it? It's, it's coming up with a unique idea that still solves a real solution, um, still solves a real problem, sorry. I mean... You're, you're someone, Helen, that you know. You speak to so many startups all of the time. Just having heard from a few of them now, what sort of advice would you give to the people that we just heard from, I suppose? Yeah, the biggest piece of advice I generally give startups is that um, don't oversell and don't overpitch. Um, you know, investors do talk to thousands of startups, you know, in a given period of time. And it's our job to figure out what both what works and does not work about a company. And if you're just very forthright about what doesn't work, and then you can follow up with what you're doing about that. Um, that's really helpful to the investor. And it also just shows that, you know, you really know what you're doing. And, you know, you're not just selling, selling, selling all the time. Right. Well, listen, Helen, thank you so much for being part of this deal stream. It's been really, really great having your expertise alongside me. I've been asking some silly questions. You've been asking the very smart ones. So thank you very much for being part of it. Thanks. It's been fun. Okay, that's pretty much all we've got time for for this episode of Deal Stream. Uh, as I said earlier, if you've not already created an account on the Climate Kick Investor Marketplace, then please go ahead and do so because, as I say, you can log on and browse a whole host of startups tailored specifically to your investment needs. All of the startups that were featured on today's episode of DealStream, you'll be able to access and contact them there. That is by uh, no doubt the best way of contacting them. Thank you ever so much uh, to the startups for being part of this deal stream. Thank you as well to Helen Lynn for asking those really interesting questions. And thank you to you as well for watching this episode of DealStream. We've got another one later on this afternoon. Please do tune in for that.